Welcome to the Early Stage Investor, where life-changing returns are the only priority. Make sure to visit silverchartistnation.com for a free weekly chart pack covering early stage assets ready to lift off. Now, here's your host. The man himself is here, Steve Penny, also known as the Silver Chartist, is in the house. He's made a lot of excellent calls and his followers, including myself, have benefited greatly. Steve, I've started sharing the silverchartistnation.com link to the audience because in my opinion, you have the best free resource out there. And I want people to experience the exceptional returns that your followers have been experiencing. Well, Elliot, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me on again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Super excited because the commodities boom that you've been predicting all along seems to have begun right? Just based on the, the moves in uranium, silver, gold, etc. So I wanted to get your thoughts on how to take advantage of it. So to start, which commodities currently excite you the most long term? Absolutely. So my three favorite commodities to play in what I believe is the early innings of a long term commodities bull market are silver, uranium and gold. But we do see a lot of upside in other commodities as well to include copper and nickel. Those are our favorite two battery metals and also platinum. But really right now, silver and uranium are the two commodities we're most excited about. Excellent. And what really excites you about this right now? Well, with both of them, they're just such small markets. And when big money tries to enter these two small markets, I think there's precedent for really explosive price moves to the upside. We're actually beginning to see that in uranium, especially today, we're breaking out to new highs. And silver, I believe, is just getting started on what promises to be an epic bull market. I've noticed that. And you know, I've been following your portfolio, which is excellent at Silver Chartist. I've seen some big moves there. In particular, one of your stocks that you've chosen in your portfolio, energy fuels. Like I, I noticed that. I read into it. Love the story. You know, bought it a few weeks ago and I'm already up 30%. <laughs> nice. Right? So so the question is it's kind of hard to buy something when it's moved so much, right? So what kind of outlook are you still seeing? And how would you kind of play this, given that it's already gone up, especially for those people that aren't in it yet? Yeah, that's a great question. I get that question a lot, because energy fuel specifically has moved up a lot. I mean, it was just, it was down at like $2 just um, a couple months ago. Now we're breaking out to new highs up around $5.50. So that's a really big move in a short period of time. But when you zoom out to like a monthly or a weekly chart going back a few years, like this stock traded at up over $20 just a few years ago. So I think there's a lot of runway ahead for energy fuels and for the uranium stocks as a whole. Now, that doesn't mean I would necessarily go chasing right here. I I like the strategy of scaling in over time. So like for me personally, and of course, I, I don't give advice, but personally, like if I had no exposure to the sector right now or to this stock in particular, and I wanted to, I might buy, you know, a fourth or a fifth of my position right now and then accumulate on weakness. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great because you still think that even though it's a runoff, let's say we start accumulating on weakness, you still think, I like to think long-term, let's say five, Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, it'll be a lot higher than where it is now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So what, what specifically, just to hone in on one of your assets within your portfolio, what specifically about energy fuels do you like? Well, it's the largest uranium miner in the United States. There's only a couple. There's Uranium Energy Corps, Encore. There's a very small number in in the United States. And Energy Fuels is the largest one. And it's the one that we had anticipated the institutions would pile into first, just because it's got that liquidity. And you know, sure enough, we're seeing that. Another nice compelling story or, or part of the Energy Fuel story is the White Mesa Mill that they have in Utah. That's a very strategic asset they have. And they're also just beginning commercial production of rare earth elements, specifically vanadium, which is a nice potential upside kicker that not many uranium stocks have. Yeah, absolutely. And what what excited me about it was, you know, I was looking at the market cap financials and everything, and I was like, okay, this is the biggest uranium miner in the United Mm -hmm. States, and it's at a $400 million market cap. And at (laughs) least it was a few weeks ago. So that was very surprising to me. And you're absolutely right. Institutions have piled in clearly just given the massive up move that's already happened. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I like to look at volume and the volume that we're seeing coming in, you know, th- that's not indicative of retail buying. It's indicative of institutional accumulation. And what's really compelling about that is institutions don't just buy once and set it and forget it. They like to, we just talked about scaling in. That's what institutions do. They like to scale in over time. And uh, it looks like we're just in the early stages of that across the sector. Excellent. And I'm glad you think there's still time to scale in. So, because this is a long-term play, right? Don't, don't mm-hmm. you kind of think, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about the timing on uranium because it seems like every 10 years there's a supply crunch because mm-hmm. all the oversupply that occurred, you know, in the prior boom is being eaten up, right? And then there's a supply crunch because demand outweighs supply. And then there's a flood of supply again, right? So where do you see us kind of in that cycle right now? Yeah, I think it's still early. Obviously, it's not as early as we were a few months ago, uh, as a lot of these stocks have really moved up, you know, two or threefold. But to me, I look at, of course, nothing's guaranteed, but it's hard to imagine a world where uranium doesn't reach $50 a pound. And currently, the spot price is around $29 a pound. And I say that $50 number, because that seems to be the consensus that a lot of the mining companies say that's the price they need to incentivize new production. And right now, we're at $30. And globally, there's only like 60 or so pure play uranium miners in the world. So there's not a lot of, uh, you know, when institutional money starts to pile in, there's not many places for them to go. And these are all relatively small market cap cap companies. So when the uranium price moves up towards $50, I mean, you can see continued explosive moves in uh, the sector and in many of the individual stocks. How long have you been calling for an up move in uranium? I know you've been a big uranium bull for a while. Like how have your subscribers done in the uranium stocks? (laughs) Um, yeah, they've done really well. I've gotten a lot of uh, great feedback on that. You know, uranium is just one of those sectors a lot, not many people have, have even heard of. It's really encouraging to be able to have been able to introduce people to this sector before the big move. And I think you're asking about, you know, how long I've been tracking it. I've been following the sector for probably almost 10 years now. Although I remember really when the Fukushima disaster happened in 2011, so that was 10 years ago, you know, that, that kind of caught my attention because it's rare you see commodity crash like that. I mean, it went from like $140 a pound in 2008 down to like $18 a pound in 2016. So I've been watching it for a long time, but waiting for this moment. So I really went in big personally in uranium on the March crash of 2020 when everything was selling off. That was when I scooped up most of my uranium miners. What perfect timing. Like, you know, a lot of people were scared then and even, they'd probably waited a few weeks and then and since then, I mean, actually that was the bottom, right? In uranium. Short it, it was, yeah. 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 So, so wow. All right. Well, that's why your portfolio is fun to look at because we have to see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't nail the bottom of course to the day or anything, but I, you know, I was, I was accumulating aggressively during that period of time. And you know, that, that is kind of the Achilles heel I can see in the uranium space, like a potential Fukushima mm-hmm. event. Right. But but the reality is, it, it seems like we have an event every 50 years. Mm-hmm. So what about all the hundreds of reactors humming all around the world for decades with no issues? It's almost like not even worth mentioning the odds of that happening. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a risk that's worth acknowledging. But like personally for me, I, I put roughly 20% of my portfolio into uranium stocks. And that percentage has grown because they've outperformed almost everything else. But to, r- roughly 20% is what I'm comfortable with. Let's move on over to silver. What percentage are you allocated to that? I look at it as precious metals make up a very large percentage of my overall portfolio, the precious metals sector. And that includes, you know, physical metal, mining stocks, senior miners, the whole, the whole gamut. But right now I've been heavily focused on junior silver miners as they present the most compelling value proposition across the precious metals complex. Although not quite as much as they did a few months ago, you know, that gold silver ratio has really come down. But I still think junior silver miners are present the most compelling value proposition um, of anything in the precious metals complex. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can see the leverage on the price of silver, how you know the juniors would be a great way to play that. So what are some companies that excite you in the silver junior mining space? Sure. Yeah. There's one in particular, and I'll, I'll just tell you, this is my favorite one to hold over the next 18 to 24 months, and that's Silvercrest Metals. They just entered what one of my mentors, Lobo Tigre, calls the pre-production sweet spot. And that's the period from where a company announces a construction decision on a mine until the first pour, until they actually begin commercial production. And if you go back and back test and study historically, that's typically 
the period of a mining company where they experienced their most rapid growth and rapid price appreciation. So uh, Silvercrest is one that I, I really like, but th- there's a bunch. You know, I, I don't. I never recommend putting all your money into one stock. You know, a basket approach is prudent because there's risk in all of these companies, no matter how much you like them. Absolutely. Yep. So this is another kind of opportunity that you would scale into over time because it's already made a move, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's it's not like some of the other ones that it's way overbought. I, I like to reference the 200-day moving average. Like I like to accumulate as close to a rising 200-day moving average as I can. So anytime we get a pullback towards that 200-day, to me, that's like the perfect point to accumulate. And we had a couple of dips towards that line in the last couple of weeks. In fact, just three days ago, three trading sessions ago, we bounced right off of that line. So we're not, we're nowhere near being overbought on this particular stock. Yeah. I've noticed that the chart has been a little bit flat. It seems like in the last year or so. So it seems like there's still some upside, which is great. So the pre-revenue, right. And, you know, with the valuation at about a billion dollars, which is what they're at, they must have a lot of silver in the ground. So are you aware of the bullish fundamental is behind the silver stores they have? You know, I do know that Silvercrest specifically has just continued to deliver extremely high grade drill result after high grade drill result. And that's yeah. a that's a pattern worth noting. We talked about, you know, the, the commodities that you're excited about, uranium, silver. I agree, tiny markets, huge upside. Institutions haven't even started pouring in, or maybe they have just begun, but retail investors do not know anything about it. So it's definitely early stage. But for the people that just aren't aware or aren't as familiar with these sectors, why do you think that this price of silver will go up and the price of uranium will go up besides just the supply demand fundamentals? Are you, are you thinking some inflation could, like, are you seeing some of that poke its head out? Yeah. For, for silver specifically, yes. I mean, of course, a, a declining dollar and rising inflationary forces benefit all commodities to include uranium. Yeah. But with your, uranium, it's more of just pure supply demand fundamentals you know, yeah. mining companies need $50 uranium and the world needs uranium to power their the power grid. So yeah. it's less of an inflation dollar debasement story, the uranium story. But with silver, yeah, absolutely. You know, silver is mostly an industrial metal. Just over half is used for industry, but that's fairly predictable. Those are fairly predictable numbers. What, what's exciting about silver is when uh, investors pile in, There's it's just such a small market. That there's roughly, if you include a uh, mine supply plus recycling, there's roughly 1 billion ounces are brought to market every year globally. And with the price about $27 now, that's a $27 billion market. That is tiny. That is minuscule. So it doesn't take very many people or a large percentage of the population to say, hey, you know what? I'd, I'd like just a little bit of silver for the price to really explode upwards. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, there's in the current events right now, it's just, you know, there's the big silver squeeze, right? Oh, right. There's, that's been huge. And, and, you know, kind of the idea is that huge banks have been manipulating silver, the price of it, and shorting mm-hmm. paper silver, the price of spot silver, whereas we're seeing epic shortages in physical silver, right? If you, you try to go buy, you know, a silver eagle, you're going to pay serious premiums. Um, mm-hmm. So can you speak a little bit about that? Because that seems to be a big topic right now. So mm-hmm why there is that big differential and how that could potentially change. So I'll just say, I believe the silver market is the most manipulated market on the planet. And there are people who can speak more intelligently about the inner workings of the COMEX and the commodities exchange than I can. But from a big picture perspective, you talk about the bankers. So yeah, they sell paper, they're short the paper markets, but guess what they're doing with you know, in their private accounts, they're accumulating physical silver hand over fist. And I'm specifically referring to JP Morgan here. So only in the silver market can you see like all-time record demand for physical silver, like we just saw last week. The the supply isn't going up. So you have a fixed supply, rising demand, and the price falls. Like, you you know, you can explain that to a kindergartner and they would say that doesn't make sense. (laughs) Why is the price falling when demand is going up? And the reason is, is that the price is set on the commodities exchange. When you go on Google or Kitco or you type in, what hey, what's the price of silver? What you're seeing is a price based on the supply demand of paper contracts that can be created at will by several large banks on the commodities exchange. And that price doesn't necessarily reflect the price you'll pay for physical silver. So right now to get your hands on physical silver, you know, it's $33, $34 an ounce on the low end, but the paper price is 27. And you know, the reason for that is because of where the price is set on the commodities exchange. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been a 
recurring issue. I just don't know what it's going to take to end this manipulation. I mean, it must have happened in the 70s when, mm-hmm. or even in 2011, where the price yeah. was up to 40 bucks. You know, I think it's probably going to happen when the Federal Reserve loses control of interest rates. Mm-hmm. You know, and and that's going to be when it's going to be out of control inflation at some point, right? Do you think that might spur it? Absolutely. And all manipulations fail. They tried doing this in the 70s. They had the London gold pool from 2000 to 2011. You mentioned, of course, there was manipulation of the silver market going on then, but it still ran up to $50 both times. Yeah. So all manipulations do fail. And I met with uh, Jim Sinclair back in about 2013. And for those not familiar with him, he, he they call him Mr. Gold. He called the gold market to the top in 1980. He's been in these markets for you know forever. Uh, he, you know, he's an older man now. But anyway, he said something that really stuck with me. And he said, when when the price goes, the bankers will be on the right side of it. And right. <laughs> so the banks aren't going to perpetually short this market. There's going to come a time when it's in their best interest to let the price run. And when it does, you know, they're they're gonna be on the receiving end of that. I wish that weren't true. You know, as evil as they might be, they're they're not stupid and they're gonna make a lot of money. And what we see now is JP Morgan specifically accumulating physical silver hand over fist. Right. But I love what you said. Manipulations always fail. So it's prudent to bank on that happening and buy it while it's still cheap, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Just buy it and just wait, wait. You know, um, and I, I don't think I don't think we're gonna have to wait very long. I I really don't. Yep. Great. So one other stock I just wanted to ask you about, because on your monthly mastermind call, you, you actually were able to speak to the CEO of this company, Metalla. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's highly exposed to silver. It's a royalty company. What kind of excites you about that, you know, especially after having that call with the CEO? I'm more of a technical analyst and Metalla has just outperformed the other royalty companies. And it, yeah. that, that's just a fact. So I can look at price and volume and the chart is compelling. But I also like their business model. I like their management and you know, speaking with the CEO, you know, it's just run by really quality, really smart people. And I like that they have more exposure to silver than other royalty companies. So yeah, Metal is the one that I really like. Okay, great. Yeah, it does seem really well run. You know, it, it has a four hundred million dollar valuation right now. So you still see a lot of growth ahead for it. I do. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but the vast majority of their projects that they have royalty and streaming deals on are in the development phase. Um, so th- yeah, so as those uh, mines come online, you know, that's just going to be icing on the cake for them, you know, as their cash flow is going to, is set to really increase in the coming years as those mines come online. Yeah. And I love just how, how like royalty companies can move with any good news and, mm-hmm. and <laughs> they trade at such a premium to cash flow. It's unbelievable, right? Like Franco Nevada, I think has a market cap of 25 billion mm-hmm. and their revenue is something in the hundred millions. Like it's, it's amazing how these royalty companies can do. Right. Mm -hmm. And then one other, I just wanted to get your thoughts on Sandstorm. They, Mm -hmm. you know, they they seem great too and and they're profitable. So, but it seems like the price hasn't moved as much as Metalla. Are you still bullish on Sandstorm? I am. Yeah. Sandstorm is one of my largest holdings. One of the things I really like about being primarily focused on the technicals is I don't have to go figure out the why of everything. Although, you know, it does help me, but the assumption is that price and volume you know, tell the story and that there's institutional traders who have access to more relevant information than I do. But one of their big projects, Sandstorm, is in Turkey. It's the Hod Maiden mine. And there's a lot of geopolitical concerns right now about Turkey. And I think that's being priced in, but I think it's being overly priced in. I think it's a, you know, overly priced in. I think that risk, you know, that presents opportunity right now. I'm, I'm actually accumulating Sandstorm pretty aggressively. Okay. Yeah. And I did not know that it was related to the Turkey potential volatility, but that would make a lot of sense. So great. So there's opportunity there. Yeah. If if that hot maiden mine, if, and when it goes into production, I can't remember exactly the timeline, but you know, it's a few years down the road, but that that is just a massive mine. That would be a game changer for Sandstorm. It's just like, it's a potential upside kicker that could provide just tremendous growth for Sandstorm. Yes. And and I agree with you. I think the technical approach is, is great because sometimes it precedes the fundamentals. You can see the price move before there's any fundamental Mm -hmm. reason for it. And you don't know why, but the charts are giving you that story. So it's great to have experts like you on talking about the technical analysis. Yeah. Yeah. I love to say that price and volume precede the news because, and yeah. And and the idea is that there's institutional traders, there's insiders who are going to get access to the information before you and I do. 
So yep. very often you'll see a big price move one way or the other, and then you'll see a headline about it, you know, a couple of days later. And that's because insiders move the market. And, you know, the, the insiders and big money banks and that, and th those types, you know, they can say one thing and lie to you, but they can't cover their tracks with price and volume. Like right. if you see, like, for example, in the uranium sector, we we're just talking about, we're seeing big money pile in, but we're not seeing any news headlines about it yet. I bet we will after the institutions have you know gotten their uh, their positions already. Just another example of price and volume preceding the news. I want to give you a big congratulations on your success with silver, precious metals, gold, and uranium. It's just unbelievable the gains the stocks have seen, and I'm excited to see that continued success in those areas. But what do you kind of see on the horizon besides these? Because like you said, they've already moved. It's time to scale in. They'll probably continue going up, but it's not exactly rock bottom right now. So you're not mm -hmm. going to see, you know, potentially that those epic gains that you've seen, you know, at the rock bottom of those commodities. So what is on the horizon that's really exciting you and that you're seeing deep value in? A lot of the commodities are, are starting to move. I mean, I, I like copper, I like nickel, but those are, have both really moved up nicely as well in the last couple of months. So yeah. nothing is at like those kind of rock bottom prices like we saw in March. In an era where they're just printing money left and right and bubbles abound everywhere, yeah. you know, the commodities still represent the best value proposition, in my opinion, that you can find anywhere. But you know, it might make sense to not go all in now because there will be more panic-driven liquidity events and panic-driven sell-offs. That's just part of it. And it's nice to have cash available to scoop up those bargains when they present themselves. Yeah. Fair enough. So it's good to have people like you with your weekly updates and guide us through these absolutely maniacal markets where everything is insane. Like Dogecoin is <laughs> pumped up by Elon Musk, right? And it, it went up like 40% the other day. I mean, it's really difficult to be a sound investor these days, you know, with all these bubbles abounding, like you mentioned. So, so you know, th thanks for that update. So where can people go to learn more about you and what kind of services are you providing? Sure. Yeah. So we started a free weekly e-letter. It's called the Silver Chartist Report. So, you know, you can go to silverchartistnation.com would be a great link to go learn more. But what, what we do is provide a free weekly e-letter every single week. We don't spam anyone. We don't, you know, hit their email inbox with all kinds of junk. It's a high quality letter for free each and every week. So I would highly encourage everyone to go do that. There is an option to upgrade to a low ticket premium service, but of course there's no pressure to do that. But silverchartistnation.com would be the place to go. Yeah, excellent. Hey, there's a track record there. I mean, you've proven it. So, you know, that's why I'm excited to be a member of it and see more of these continued gains. So, and then actually quickly, so what does your low ticket service offer that people can opt into potentially for a small monthly fee? Sure. Yeah. It, we keep it really cheap. I mean, it, I really think it's the best value out there as far as precious metals newsletters go, just because of how inexpensive we keep it. And we do that because we want to be able to serve the, the most amount of people, you know, yeah. our, our hardest to serve just everyday hardworking people who are trying to navigate these markets. Um, so we keep it really cheap and uh, they get a, a premium version of the weekly letter that includes our focus list stocks of the week. So those are stocks that I own that are approaching chart-based entries. And I give specific buy zones and targets where I would personally accumulate. They get real-time alerts. So anytime I personally buy or sell, I let all of our members know in real time. We have a private Twitter feed. We do a live monthly mastermind call with industry experts where the members can come on and interact in person in real time with people. You know, like we've had Lobo Tigre on, we've had um, uh, Jerry Robinson, one of my trading mentors. Um, we're scheduled to talk with the, the dollar milkshake, Brent Johnson coming up soon. So uh, th there's, a, there's just so much that members get who, who choose to go with the premium service. Well, the Silver Chartist Nation is growing and I can't wait to see it grow even more. And I just hope everyone can join it, you know, a group of like-minded individuals and mm -hmm. check out your portfolio and all these great people you bring on. Yeah. Th thanks so much, Elliot. We also have some contributors now too. So a lot of people know Jeff Clark. Jeff Clark is contributing almost every week. We've got Patrick Karam, Kevin Wadsworth. So it, it's just a really great team we've, we've got. And the goal is just to provide tons and tons of value to all the members. This video contains an affiliate link. While it will take you directly to Steve's brilliant free newsletter, if you do decide to make a purchase on the website, I will receive a small commission. In full transparency, I wanted to disclose that to you. This discussion is for informational purposes only. 
Nothing in this discussion should be taken as investment advice. Guests are not compensated for their appearance. Do not base any investment decisions on the information presented.